Are you ready? Uh, yeah, as soon as yeah. Wait, should I? I should also be screen sharing. Let's do that. Well, what just happened? Oh, now it just moved it over here. Yeah, but it moved us over here. Okay. We should be good, I think. And now it won't work. Okay, here we go. Wait. Good? Yeah. Are you ready for an excellent presentation? Come right up. Yes. Um, okay, so my name is Mitchell Collins. I was here 2017 to 2021, graduated with a physics degree and a minor in math. Um, I like to paddleboard and play soccer and snowboard, and I also played volleyball this summer, and it was awesome, so that was good. Uh, I like working on my car and uh, gaming and modic stuff. All right, we go to the next slide. Um, there's me and my two roommates at the Pillars right in the middle of COVID, and we couldn't actually do it past the Pillars, so that kind of sucked. But um, I graduated the Bachelors, and then I went on to Binghamton, and I was there for two years, and I got a degree in mechanical engineering. And I just graduated uh, 2023. May. We go to the next one. Uh, I currently work at, New at a nuclear power station, Nine Mile Point, in Oswego, New York. I work there as a system engineer. And if you have questions, we can talk about that afterwards. Um, these are some of my projects that I've done recently. I don't know if anybody's noticed the solar panels that live outside this building, as well as the system. Um, me and Dr. Gallagher worked on that, along with Nick Kilmer, who probably doesn't even exist anymore. Um, I also built a portable GameCube, if anybody's old enough to know about a GameCube. Um, I chopped a Wii and soldered a bunch of PCBs together and built that. And my recent project was at Binghamton. It was our senior design project, which you'll be working on soon. Um, and that I built pretty much an independent wind energy system that's designed to be on a highway and catch wind from passing cars. And so this presentation, I'm going to kind of talk about that and walk you through kind of the design process. How many are in here are in the 3-2 program? Okay, a couple. That's exciting. Um, so this will be kind of stuff that you'll be doing when you get to that next school. I'm uh, trying to get a meeting code one second. <laughs> um, so I had this idea, actually me and another friend had this idea to create this system to catch wind from passing cars. We thought that was a, a waste of energy and potential that could be turned into electricity that is just squandered. So we kind of thought about, you know, how would we set that up? And so we were kind of thinking, you know, there's a median barrier alongside a highway that would be pre that's pretty close to cars to catch wind because uh, energy from wind drops off exponentially the farther you get away from the passing car. So we kind of came up with this idea. And then my team and I, I was uh, the team lead, so I led four other students to build this thing. We kind of brainstormed a bunch of criteria. I'm not going to go through all these, but you guys can, you know, kind of check them out. Um, we looked into uh, Department of Transportation laws. So we kind of found a, uh, like a signage law that kind of gave us some parameters, um, how strong something needed to be, how big it was, the visual instruction code, stuff like that. So a lot of that was based off of this. Um, some of it was safety. And then we also figured, why not make it hurricane proof? So we figured a hurricane could get up to 110 miles an hour. So that was going to create you know, a moment on this, this mount and the system. Um, and so we kind of designed it to be able to withstand that kind of force. Uh, we also kind of talked about, you know, we don't want the turbine to, to stall out if there's ambient wind happening and it's too fast. You know, we want to be able to maintain that. So we looked into kind of turbine designs that would, that would withstand this wind force coming through. Uh, we also wanted to be able to fit on the Jersey barrier. So we had that kind of, that kind of size stuff. And, you know, if, uh, Theoretically, if this came to fruition, we want them to be able to be installed easily and quickly and cheaply. So that was kind of that was kind of the design criteria we laid out when we started designing. All right, we go to the next one. Um, so this is some of the brainstorming we did. We kind of figured, you know, let's let's have this mount. Let's try to bolt it into this concrete. You know, we'll use like concrete anchors, and 
will have some kind of pole to hold it and then kind of a turbine on top, right? So you got a turbine, you need to have a hollow pole to have wires come through and then out to hook up to a different system, whether you're tapping right into the grid, whether you're tapping into a battery system. So that was kind of our thought process here. Uh, and then we kind of had to do stress analysis. So we actually started out uh, with that. Oh, I forgot I show and tell. This was so, so unprofessional. So I 3D printed a little model of our first, of our first stuff. Um, you can pass that around, you guys can kind of check it out. And then we, you know, we, we kind of started with this, and this was this was kind of overkill. We kind of talked about it, and like this was this was a a lot of manufacturing work, a lot of production work. Really, like, you know what? We'll just we'll try to trim it down. Like this is over engineering, which is a common issue. Um, and so we kind of worked around with some stuff. I um, I didn't directly do the finite element analysis. Does anybody know what FBA is? Okay, so I didn't know what it was until I got to Binghamton. I was like, what the hell is this? Like, I don't know what that is. Um, and basically what it is, is it's kind of like, it's a program that calculates stress on a, on a 3D model. And what it does is it puts a mesh around this 3D model and then calculates stress using common stress calculations um, at each point. And then it kind of summarizes all that. Um, so we use ANSYS Workbench, I think, which might want to do a little peek into that because some of that software is free use. Could be helpful. Uh, what, what's this? ANSYS Workbench. Okay. I think it's all the adding for it. It does. That's true. Yeah. Might be a, might be a good plan. Yeah. Ansys. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this was kind of our brainstorming session. I did a lot of this modeling. Um, has everybody done the CAD class yet? Oh, okay. You'll, are you, is everybody going to do it? Uh, Who's running that? Um, <laughs> I, I sent a very persuasive email to everybody telling them how important it was, especially if they want to do the jury things. It is. Um, and, and we got some people that are cool. Okay, very good. I would highly recommend that. And it's fine, because you just you just get to build stuff. It's very low stakes. Um, so we kind of did this. We go to the next slide. Um, and then this was kind of our stress analysis. So we figured, okay, it's a hurricane wind. Let's say this pole is like three feet, the turbine is only three feet. So we're about six feet tall, right? And so if we have this force coming on this turbine, which is essentially we'll model it as, as kind of a, a cylinder, um, we'll have, you know, this wind force coming in. We calculated that, and then we had it kind of push. So like, on, like a moment on this, on this cylinder. So we calculated the stress there. We did a hand calculation there, and then we kind of ran that in FDA. We also figured because it'll be spinning, there'll be a torque on that pole and on the mount. So we ran calculations on that and tested that in FDA using each of our models there. And this kind of turned out to be the best. Um, it was the simplest, had the less, the, almost the least amount of stress, but it, it would survive. So we had a pretty high um, safety factor. Uh, we'll go to the next one. And then this was kind of our overall design. So you can kind of see how it all came together. Um, we had concrete bolt anchors coming into the mount, into the into the concrete, and then a big pole. We had to actually do another upside down mount, which would see much less stress. So we were able to simplify the model a little bit. Um, and then that would connect to our turbine, and then kind of all bolt together. So that was that's kind of the the idea there. Uh, you got nice one. And then this was kind of the implementation. So like this was the fun part. So like. At Binghamton, and I know a lot of other engineering schools, so everybody that goes on, um, you'll do the senior project and you'll start to kind of manufacture stuff. And this was like a really cool opportunity. Like I, I built stuff with Dr. Gallier, thank, thankfully, so I had kind of an idea, but everybody else had like no clue how to do anything. Um, so we ordered that turbine and we kind of put it together. I am missing a lot of pictures, so I didn't get everything, but we got a couple things. Uh, and so, at Binghamton, they actually have a whole machine shop. So we were able to order steel plates as long as, as well as a cold rolled steel cylinder. But uh, we were able to drill press a lot of the stuff. And then me and another student uh, welded it all together, which was super cool. So I had never welded before, so don't mock my welds. I know they're a little, you know, dotty. Um, and then we sent it to a company to powder coat it. We figured, you know, if this is going to be a long side of road, it's probably going to see a lot of salt, a lot of water, a lot of corrosive stuff. We figured the powder coating would, you know, protect it and increase the longevity of this of this product. Um, and then we kind of we, you know, bolted everything together and and uh, mounted it. I think we go to the next picture. And so that that was kind of the whole thing. Uh, we tested it outside. A lot of this I did actually rip from my previous work. So uh, we calculated how much energy this thing was going to produce. We figured out 
you know, what size inverter we needed to pull from the battery. We calculated the wire size based off of voltage coming through those wires. Um, we had a couple of breakers coming through. So there's our big battery and that hooks up. Everybody's seen the system in 121, right? Yeah, so it looks pretty similar to that, I'm gonna be honest. Um, have you kind of gone over how it works with everybody? Uh, no. Oh. Uh, well, like occasionally. <laughs> it depends about us slightly less. Okay. Perfect. So everybody's got an idea how it kind of goes together. Um, and so that was kind of it. So like most of the project was, was getting this mount and figuring out how it could survive, how it could be modeled, how it could be manufactured, and how it could be, you know, corrosion resistant. Um, and then I kind of went above and beyond and just added an energy system to it because I knew how to do it. Um, and so we actually, we poured a bunch of concrete in a bucket and that was kind of fun. And we mixed all that together. And so that was kind of our replicating our Jersey barrier. Um, and yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of the whole, the whole shebang. Um, we go next slide. Do I have one more? Oh, good. Um, question. Did you ever pull one on a road to see if you could get energy? I did not, but we did drive a car by it right. and it did move. So, and we had ambient wind, so, and it, you know, it turned for a while. It wasn't able to charge phones. Yes, we were charging phones. So, I, I could see how this would be very viable in like, so let's say, but up here, unless we would take it down during the winter storms, for example, when you have the snow plows just coming through, like, tons of this solid green and everything over it. That's what I, my concern would be. That's right. For us, it's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I know that a lot of highway services use galvanized uh, products for their metal. Um, did you look into other methods besides powder coating? We did. We did look into that. Uh, I think galvanizing was like a little bit more expensive than we were planning. So I think it was. I think it was cheaper to just get the the raw steel that we needed and then to just powder coat it rather than get and work with galvanized steel. Um, so that was kind of our our choices for that design option. Uh, during senior design, who's all your professor? Zayt. Yeah, easily the best Binghamton engineering professor. If anybody goes to Binghamton, Zayt, check your man. He's the best. Any other questions? We can talk about like my transferring projects, what I do now, stuff like that. So if anybody has questions about that, what does the system do? Great question. Um, I'm still going to figure that out because I just started a couple months ago. But a lot of my job at a nuclear power plant is kind of um, a lot of it's like energy management because these plants are so old. I know um, our unit one started up in 1969, so it's coming up on six years. Uh, unit two, I think, is starting up um, coming up on 40. So a lot of this stuff is uh, you know it's been in, it's been working for a long time. So a lot of it's aging management, you know, making sure we don't have enough corrosion products. Uh, a lot of it's like system health stuff. So I track. Um, you know, like vibration or temperature in a system and like see if that's kind of a problem or if that's degrading. Um, I work on troubleshooting. So like if something's wrong with it, we, we go to the team room and we troubleshoot like, okay, like this could be it or like maybe this is failed or stuff like that. Um, so a lot of my job is like system health tracking and aging management stuff. But it's, uh, I guess it's called the plant and that's super cool because the nuclear power plant is way more complicated than I realized as soon as I stepped in. Um, and we... Yeah, it's pretty cool to be in there, to be honest. Yeah. So, I, you have a lot of mechanical engineering background for this job. Um, but did you know anything about nuclear power plants ahead of time? I. And how did you learn if you did? I'm going to be honest. I didn't even know that I had applied to a nuclear power plant when I got the position. So uh, I kind of figured it out on the fly. I had no clue how to make nuclear power. I had actually never looked into it. I really only knew solar and wind and gas, of course. Um, does, there, does everybody know how nuclear power works? You know? It's pretty cool, actually, and it's way different than I imagined it, and it's way different than the Simpsons tell you it is. Um, so basically, you have a reactor with uranium rods that are inside this. Essentially, it's just a metal cylinder. And I work at a boiling water reactor, so those rods get really hot. We send water through a feed water system into the reactor. And basically, they have a, a recirculation system that kind of pulls water and keeps it moving, and that kind of um, controls reactivity. And that water boils, and it goes through a moisture separator and a... Um, what's the answer? And then... Uh, but basically, what it does is it separates the water droplets out of the steam 
So you, uh, you, so basically when it comes out, it's like 99% steam, which is different than water vapor, fun fact. And then it goes through a turbine, and the turbine spins, and then the turbine spins the generator, and then it sends power to the grid. So it's actually, uh, in concept, simpler, but it's governed by the NRC and a lot of government like regulation bodies. So there's a lot of there's a ton of safety systems you need because you can't actually turn off a reaction once it starts. Um, so you need like decay heat removal, um, shut down cooling, stuff like that. So it does kind of a simple process of how it works. And I learned that pretty much in uh, in August. So no clue before that. That's when you started. I started in July. But you know, there's a lot of in processing stuff like that. So yeah. are you the are you the boss of anybody? No. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I was a bigger than I was a team lead. Okay. No. And I, I was the boss of Nick Kilmer when we were working on it. You were not okay. uh, he would not agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not here. So. <laughs> That's good. Any other questions? What was your favorite thing about Binghamton? It was probably working on this project and like getting to work with the machine shop. Because like we just we just don't have the resources here to, to kind of do that. Like we have a lake, like there's a lathe there and like drills and welding material, and uh, there's a, a water jet, um, which is super cool. And then there, I mean, there's just a ton of tools and it's pretty impressive the equipment they have over there, I gotta be honest. Yeah. How easy was welding? You said that was your first time? It was. Yeah. Um, you think it's going to be easy. And then you pull down the visor and you can't really see shit. So then it's like, oh God, where am I? And you literally just have to follow the art and like keep, you know, making little circles and making little dimes on your, on your well. It took a couple of tries, not going to lie. I did have a really good well towards the end. Yeah. Um, what kind of the nuclear power plant as a systems engineer do you want to do? Because a mechanical engineer didn't be the most useful to be for that job. <laughs> They seem to love electrical engineers. It's a big thing. Apparently, uh, we're short on electrical engineers, but um, it's hard. Yeah, I mean, mechanical engineering, you can do you can do a lot. Like, there's a lot of different places you can go. There's a lot of different positions that you can fill. So it's uh, I would say it's a it's a versatile degree to have. Um, people love electrical engineers right now. So if you're up for that, that's a little challenging. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, mechanical is good for that. And like there's a, a there's design engineering too there. So they work on like modifications for different systems that are already in place. They work on the drawings. Um, drawings are, I don't know if I ever drawn. Drawings are basically just the 3D model in a 2D space. I didn't know what drawings were before I met the bank. So um, yeah, so I mean it's pretty desirable. Do you have a question, Nick? Uh, no, I was just going to point out the rooms on the floor there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think Tom uh, Yeah. Uh, I spent a little bit of time working on a solar pump piece and like, like this kind of thing, kind of learn about like nuclear when you first learn, kind of learn from the same thing. And I feel like in my studies, like, like most of solar is like a great thing. And people really only talk about a lot of renewables in like a good light. And I came to find out in some of my studies there that like, there are some. Negative effect on like that. Have you like learned of any so far that comes along with nuclear? Yeah. Um, I would say probably the, the biggest risk um, is radiation. Um, these the plant the way the US plants are designed, the the likelihood of another Chernobyl event is like just close to nothing. Um, and the way they, the governing bodies are, but we do like it's challenging to have like equipment, like a radiated equipment, because basically that stuff stays radioactive for a long time, depending on how long it was exposed. Um, I know a lot of our, like we technically do send radioactive, um, like air through our, we, that exits to the stack, that's called an off-gas stack. Um, but that gets pretty dispersed, so there's not like a huge ton of danger there, but um, other than radioactive products, and then uh, we do end up running emergency diesel generators. We do those every month, and we burn through a ton of diesel fuel because the, the diesels are are godsend if you lose power. Um, so I would say those are those are some big negatives. But other than that, it's cleaner than you usually think it is. Uh, I'll go you first. Uh, what is your thought on thorium as an alternative to basically uh, uranium? <laughs> Haven't looked into it, so not really super knowledgeable to answer that. But I'll get back to it. 
Can you talk about the governing bodies of um, the nuclear power plant for us, like the new regulations that you have to follow? Oh, okay. Um, so when you license a power plant, you have to do it through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is the government, basically. Um, and you come up with, you, they come up with technical specifications. So that's like, I need to run this plant, like how much this, how much that. And then you need to come up with a final safety analysis report, which is, the last time I checked, it's like 4,000 pages of like, this is what we do in emergency. Like, this is how we handle this. This is the flex system. Like, this is, um, you know, we have this state of emergency. This is how we contact authorities. This is what systems well, to put in place. Is there like other things you're talking to the button stuff? Not like some crazy politics? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yep. Um, and so there's, so we have we have the NRC, and then there's there's an organization called Info, and basically Info is like nuclear insurance. So like if you so you pay Info this much, and if something happens, you need like some crazy part or something broke, like you go to Info and like this is how you get that part. But they're also on you, just like um, you know if Geico was like, well your headlights don't work, like you get an accident at night, like we're not helping you. So like there's regulations through Info that to run the plant, um, and then there's a uh, there's like a third one, it's a little less important, but there's, yeah, those are like the big three governing bodies that are like, this is what you need to do. And like, um, if something goes wrong or like something's broken or like we're doing maintenance on something, we enter uh, what's called an LCO, which is a limited condition of operation. So if we don't fix this within a certain amount of time, we have to shut down the reactor. Um, and it's obviously no good for making power. So there's, uh, there's a lot going on. It's stuff that I'm still kind of figuring out. Yes. I have two questions. Uh, I think um, are the machine shops open up on weekends, and can anyone just sort of walk in? Um, well, you need to have a student ID, and they also need to have access to the machine shops. Um, they give like your card, like access to that, depending on who you ask. Uh, but they are open on weekends for limited hours, so you could like go in there and like work on stuff if you needed. Do they have a training regiment to for you to go through in order to be qualified to use the machine shop on your own? Yes, they do. They you have to go talk to the uh, the shop techs, and so basically they'll they'll kind of run you through like you know basic safety stuff like don't hit your hand with a hammer, wear safety goggles, wear helmet, and stuff like that. Um, so there's like a little bit of training. Yep. <laughs> so what's your like? What's the dream end job? After that is a question that I ask myself every day. Um, I really have no idea. I knew as soon as I got here, I wanted to go into something renewable, some kind of clean energy. I really like generation because I love the miracles of electricity. Um, and want to make sure that we don't, you know, burn that out. Um, for a long time, I really wanted to get into solar, and then I was kind of thinking about wind, and then somehow I found myself at a nuclear power plant. Um, but right now, I am really curious about hydrogen and the potentials of hydrogen. Um, my own point actually is, I believe the first nuclear power plant, even in the country, to have a hydrogen generation, um, you know, machine on site. So, like during all, like during non-peak hours, we actually send power to hydrogen generation. And we actually make hydrogen on site, which is super cool. I guess that there's a hydrogen-powered plane somewhere in the world. There is somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is, it's a possibility and it's, uh, you know, it's an exciting field right now. Uh, what were the engineering classes like at the uh, Like where it was charging, like pain in the ass, like, it's all with it. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to say the first time that I got the thing, I was coming off senior year as a COVID senior. Um, and I was just like, oh, I got, I got through EM, I got through circuits. I got through, you know, yeah, um, like no big. And then all of a sudden I was like, wow, I'm getting my ass kicked. Um, I think the biggest difference, like the biggest thing to remember when you get to that second school is the, the sheer volume of work, right? Like, yeah, like your Fox and French, like they talk to each other, they're not trying to murder you. And they know like when mm -hmm. your math courses are kicking in. So they're like, all right, like we'll go easy on it. But uh, they do not care when you get there. So I think, I like to say that like no class is harder than EM or quantum. So like say quantum and EM is like a 10 out of 10 difficulty. I would say the 
hardest class you're going to take at that next engineering school is probably like seven or eight, but there's going to be like five <laughs> all at once. So like, that's kind of the biggest thing. Um, and I had a really terrible ODE, um, like dip and Q teacher while I was here. Who was it? Was it constant? constant <laughs> no, I did not have goose. I had goose for top three. Oh, um, I had a uh, Paul McKay. Because I had, I had, I had Paul McKay. I had a lot. I don't know, but I didn't really learn anything, and that was a problem when I got into engineering analysis and stuff like that. So, like, I would say, you know, differential equations really you should know. Um, and I really struggled with materials. I'm not super interested in materials, so maybe that was kind of the issue. Um, but that was a really challenging course for me, and I know. Um, we had the same year, and he taught strength and materials, but it was like his first year teaching. So like it wasn't super thorough. You all thought the class average in material would be around a 40 for every exam? Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, that, that doesn't really change. Yeah. Um, how big were the classes? At Binghamton, we had about 120 people in the mechanical engineering program. And like you bring the state classes with all of them, for the, especially junior year. Senior year, you get a little more option and like, um, technical courses you get to take. So like I took uh, like an intro to FBA class my senior year. Um, and then I only had like 20. What was that last class that you took that was an elective? What was it called? Intro to FBA, finite element analysis. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, and I took uh, an aerodynamics class and that was kind of interesting. And so like once you get there, there's only like about 30, 20 to 30. But, yeah. You go to 120 person class I lost my personal time with your professors. I don't know for me when I'm struggling, I like to annoy them to um really you know rack my brain or just give me the answers. Yeah. So like um, I have a different person class and also like not necessarily give me the answers, but to like communicate or just bounce ideas off each other. Yeah, most of the professors are like they'll definitely answer your questions and like um I would highly recommend going to office okay. hours, just like here. Always just live in their office. Oh, I do. Yeah, so that's important. Hey, rent no one but his office. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like there is there is that ability, but I mean it's a it's a very different vibe than you know having Fox yell at you at UNM for twenty minutes. Um, <laughs> so like there's it's supportive. <laughs> it is it is supportive. Um, so it's definitely like an adjustment, and I would definitely recommend like sitting near the front and like definitely speaking up in class because like the more they know you, the more the better off you're going to be. Um, yeah, it's it's different, but um, they're usually good about office hours. Sometimes it's challenging because there'll be like 10 of you, oh, you know? Yeah. It's like that kind of sucks, but go at the right time. It's pretty good. So, What's your uh, typical day like when you go to work? Um, uh, well, this week has been really hectic because we go into refilling outage next week. Um, but usually I'll kind of get there and uh, I'll kind of settle in and then we'll do like a morning meeting. So we'll get like a plant update on like, you know, how things are running, what's on the uh, media concerns list and stuff like that. Um, and then some, uh, every couple of weeks I'll do like a walk down. So like I'll go into the plant and like check out like the system that I am technically in charge of. And I'll make sure like everything's running there and like look at the gauges and like look at the general aging management stuff. Um, and then from there, it's, it's a lot of like data, data trending um, coming up with emergent issues, we get, um, we're owned by Constellation. So like Constellation has their own nuclear engineers that send us like, this is what, you know, send us work and stuff like that. Um, and that's kind of like a lot of it. A lot of it's like meetings or like updates. Um, yeah, kind of the day-to-day -day stuff. Yeah. Is there a lot of people where you work with say nuclear? Um, <laughs> so on site, we have, I think, like 750 people, but that's including security, that's including like the maintenance techs, that's including, um, you know, management, and that's including uh, operations, as well as engineering. But, and we have to wear hazmat suits. Uh, we don't have to dress up too often, but uh, it's annoying when we do, I gotta be honest. Yeah. Um, but there's about, I think, 30 system engineers and about 30 design engineers. So, closer, like, around like 50 engineers total on site. Um, and we all are in charge of like various systems and stuff like that. So there's a lot to do, a lot going on. How do you balance work and life? Great question. Um, still figuring that out. It's uh, <laughs> it's an adjustment to like go from class and like having this time in between class and like get homework done and like just kind of you know being in charge of this. And then uh, you know when you work forty hours a week and then. Um, 
for me, I have, I drive an hour both ways. So that kind of sucks up a lot of time too. But I do get to work remote twice a week, most of the time, which is nice. Um, but I mean, you gotta kind of, you gotta kind of prioritize stuff. I'm like, you know, like, do I really need to make this commitment or like, do I need to, you know, go out and do this? Um, and like, you know, you can't just sit down and play Zelda for 20 hours a week, yeah. it sucks. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a weird adjustment. I don't really, I don't have a whole ton of advice for you, but you'll figure it out when you get there and don't be scared. Yes. You said the clan's in Oswego, right? Yep. What's the population of the Camino? As far as I know, they don't really mind. I mean, um, it doesn't it doesn't really affect us too much. I know it provides, um, they do a lot of like volunteering stuff in, in Oswego, so like they get that. Um, and like, you know, they get their power and stuff, so I think they're I mean, nuclear for the most part is kind of largely ignored. And there's only three reactors in New York. And apparently we provide 30% of all of Europe's power. I think I did not know. Yeah. Did one get shut down in our 2021? Yes, Indian Point did get shut down. Yeah. Um, would you have rather the doors than like any other school besides Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, when I was here, I think my options were like Binghamton, Clarkson, thought about RIT, and I thought about RPI. Um, but I I didn't really want to go to like a private school. So Binghamton was kind of like a closer option. And I visited Clarkson while I was in high school. I wasn't like a huge fan of Clarkson. So um, and like I liked I like going to a primarily liberal arts school. Um, I, I usually find that there's you know more uh, variety of, of fun people to hang out with. Because like when you go to an engineering school, you're going to an engineering school, okay? Um, and so a lot of those people are, I don't know, they just weren't really somebody that I was really kind of jealous with. So I, I liked Binghamton while I was there. Um, I should have gotten more involved, but I was, I don't know, stressed out. So it didn't really, but um, Binghamton was good. And they had a, they were a pretty good program. So I had a couple of professors um, and they had good stuff there, yeah. And it, I mean, it's, you know, it's got a similar vibe to many apps. Like you have those campus events, you have like, you know, the support system, you have an nice campus line. Okay. Does it feel cool to be an engineer? And, and like, when you tell somebody that you're an engineer, what, how do they react? Uh, most of the time they're like, oh God. Just like when you tell people that you're a physics major. Um, <laughs> so it's a lot of, and it's like, oh my God, you're so smart. I'm like, no. No, nah, not really. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's, it's cool. Like I think about, like, oh yeah, I guess I'm like I'm a system engineer right now. Like that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's all right. Any other questions? Uh, I want to learn more, hear more about your turbine project. Like, how did you um, research the uh, shape of the blades or size of them? To so a lot of that kind of went into the restrictions of being on a road, right? So we kind of thought about like a horizontal axis turbine, like the big ones you see. Um, and we were like, it doesn't really work because you get, you know, it, the wind coming through would be fine, but those blades would probably be big enough to be energy efficient enough to get that catch of wind without, you know, hitting a car. Um, and so we looked into a lot of like vertical axis wind turbines. And there's like a ton of them. And we kind of found, we wanted one that would be able to spin both ways, just in case. Um, you know, say that we can tab on the road, so we wanted something to spin. Um, I don't remember the exact reason why we settled on that particular design, um, but we did put some thought into it. And we wanted something to spin both ways. It needed to be kind of compact um, and fairly efficient. So that was kind of why we settled on that design. Why did you want it to be able to spin both ways? Just in case no cars are running by and then, you know, the wind changes direction and maybe it'd be fine. Yeah, it sounds like your, your project was very, um, just in case this happens. Cause yeah. <laughs> your, your hurricane resistance to 110 miles per hour up at this at latitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, just in case. So I could not. No, 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 you're good, you're good. <clears throat> um, the physics department faculty had a discussion about your project. Oh, um, <clears throat> with, the with, with the president of the university. Um, and um, 
And we wondered, did you think about the fact that um, as, as a car drives through, it creates a wind. The turbine is gonna take energy out of the wind, slowing it down. Yep. And thereby- Using uh, drag on the car. Putting the drag on the car behind it. Yep. We did think about that. Um, we actually ran an analysis based on how much, uh, there was a study that actually we found. Um, that Can wind, you send me that study? I have to find it again, but I could try. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Finish. They did basically what we were thinking about. And so they they, calculated, they estimated how much drag would actually be induced on the car and like how much cost and energy that is. Yeah, yeah. And so they evaluated having a turbine there is actually still a net positive. But it, it does induce drag. Yeah. That's a good question. I'm so proud of it. <laughs> 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 yeah. Any other questions? Nobody want to, oh. When you were at Binghamton, um, how many different countries were the other students and faculty from? Well, that is more than one yes. Yeah, I would definitely say more than one yes. <laughs> it's more international, isn't it? Yes, it is. We, um, I know there was a large population of, uh, Indian foreign exchange students. We had a couple of professors, I believe one was from South Korea, another one was from China, another one was from Russia. Um, I believe we had one from India as well. But it definitely was a little bit more diverse. I will say that. What's on the one from Russia? They check. They check it from Russia. Yep. Do you have Google? I don't think so. Use the Google system. No, I had, um, I don't think I know what you're saying. Do you have any question back, Gary? Oh, yeah, dozens. Um, <laughs> um, how did you rise to the group leader? Pretty much by default. Um, <laughs> so some of this was because of I did it for my junior design project with my other friends, and he wanted to work on an F1 car because there's, a, there's an F1 car making team at, uh, at Binghamton, which is cool. Um, and my professor came up to me and was like, how about you submit this to get approved for like a senior project position? I was like, okay, sure. And I submitted it and it got approved. And then surprisingly, I had people had interest in it. And so I kind of set up everything and they're like, well, you've been working on this for three months. Like, why don't you just be team lead? And I was like, that's a good idea. I'll do it. <laughs> First senior design, are you able to sort of do your own project? Like I know I currently have my junior design project. I was hoping I'd be able to turn that into my senior design project. Yes, you could. You um at the end of the semester, so you'll be able to submit project proposals. And so do that and then hopefully it'll get approved. Yeah. Did you get like an individual budget for your project? Yes. Or like a lot of um, I know that we got a little bit extra money because it was technically a renewable project. Um yeah, who donated it, but we had like $2,500, I believe. Um, and I think most of the other projects had around like 15 ish So, but we, I believe we did it all for like 1700 bucks. And that was, um, we got some of the booty stuff. So why not? We have all this money. Um, so that was, yeah, that was our budget. So when you had a job interview, you got to talk about supervising these people because you're a team leader. I did. Running the project, yeah. How excited you were about it. So was it like a good resume thing? Yeah, definitely. Getting the job, that's cool. Yeah, I would recommend trying to do that. Um, as long as you can, you know, coordinate people. So. <laughs> so you think you developed your people skills? I think so. Yeah, it was it was definitely a good development opportunity. Um, and, uh, yeah, learned kind of how to lead. Other than Nick Kilmer, he's a little he's a little ornery sometimes. So. <laughs> Yeah, it was good. <laughs> yeah, what was this? Were you always part of the teaching program? Yeah, so yeah, my junior year, uh, Dr. Gallier had convinced me, like, hey, why don't you look into this master's program? You seem to be in renewable energy stuff. So I was like, oh, hey, why don't I look into that? 
And so I did. And then a week later, I had to sign a lease because otherwise you're not going to get any housing. And then I was in a lease and I was like, yeah, I don't know. And then um, I think I got to the end of the junior year and I was like, I don't really want to do grad school. So I'll just keep with the tree tip. So, so I was here the full four years. It probably worked out because um, otherwise my first year at Binghamton would have been fully remote, which would have kind of sucked because I know um, Dylan and Muhammad did that and they were struggling. So what was the switch like? Like go from here to the right? Like personally or yeah, like personally, yeah, like, like personally, like you know, in school and stuff like that. <sighs> um, kind of sucked. I'll be honest. Um, I really loved Oneonta, and I really liked the friend group that I had made. So like, it kind of sucked to have them like kind of graduate, like me still be in school. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of challenging, but um, I'm usually uh, my girlfriend will attest that I'm usually fairly social, so it, it wasn't too bad to make friends. Um. It is different because like you kind of make friends, you know, freshman year and you kind of grow up with them. And so you kind of transfer in, like everybody's kind of already have their groups. So that's kind of a difficult transition. And I would, I definitely recommend like joining clubs or like going to, you know, meetings and stuff like that. Um, at Binghamton, there's uh, the ASME club. Um, but some mechanical engineers run that, and so they'll host events. And sometimes that was good to go to to kind of like meet my other engineers because, like, you pretty much have classes with the same 120 people for like all of junior, half of senior year. So it's good to like make friends with them, and they can help you out of you know binds and like, hey, like, I don't know what this material problem is. How do I know where the fracture is? Stuff like that. Um, but I'm not gonna say it's super easy. So, but it'll be okay. Yeah. So I imagine Binghamton already had their own set of mechanical engineering students. Yes. How did you feel? Was it like a competition between you and them? Did you feel like you have anything to prove against those students or anything like that? I personally didn't know. I'm sure maybe some people did, but um, it, yeah, it wasn't super big. Okay. So with the project, did you guys like discuss how maintenance would work on those things? Because I know like maintenance on the highway can like very easily become a problem, but the baby in the saddle would right? great. Yes. And yeah. Like, would that still kind of be like messy trying to fix something from the moment? It definitely could be, depending on where they were placed. Um, they, yeah, so they were kind of designed to be on a Jersey barrier, which typically is in between, you know, two, two lines of traffic. Um, so we didn't really think about that too much. That's, I think that's why we kind of put a lot of effort into like make sure that it was, um, you know, pretty sturdy and could actually survive a lot of fatigue and a lot of corrosion products and stuff like that. Um, but we didn't put a whole lot of thought in the maintenance, I'll be honest. That's a good, that's a good call. No. Can we see the papers done on uh, uh, the report? Yeah. Yeah, I can send that up. I can send that to Dr. Gallagher, and I'm sure he will judiciously I spread it out. Um, the report you wrote for your project? Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I have a copy of it somewhere. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I read through most of it. I just skipped through with a lot of details. Yeah, there are. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty detailed report they wanted us to get. But yeah, I feel like it's pretty good. I'd say so. Any other questions? Do you have any fond memories of Oneana? Yes, many fond memories. Yeah. yeah. It's so nice to see you. I'm so glad you come. I know. It's wonderful to see all of you as well. I remember the first time that I found out that you only get a haircut once a day. Walking into physics two, and you were just bald one day. Wow, that's a shift. <laughs> once a year. Yep. Once a day. Yep. Once a day. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Everyone asked me my portable GameCube. It took me all summer. <laughs> what do you want to talk about that? Actually, about the portable game. Is it like, it's like an emulator, or do you have to like? No, but the game. So I literally took a Wii, I hacked it, which is super easy to do. Highly recommend if you're in a game through Wii. Um, and I literally took it out of this motherboard and I took a Dremel to it and I literally chopped it into pretty much half a size. And so I had to sand that down to make sure that you know none of the layers were touching, so it's short out. And so then once I got that working, I hooked it up to a couple of batteries and made sure that it actually turned on. I had to turn on the video up. Um, so it's it's real hardware, which was exciting. Yeah. So you have batteries for it, right? How yeah. long does it last for it to get turned? It lasts about like four hours. 
I got to repeat. Here, if, uh, if my clicker. Sorry. Go back to the, go back to like the third slide or so. Yeah, yeah, right there. So these are the these are the two batteries. They're like uh, 10,000 10, watt hours, something like that. But they're pretty beefy. Um, I don't have any pictures of the stuff beneath, but that's the wheat. That's a real wheat right there. Fun fact. Yeah, so you, you basically chop out all the bolts and regulators, and then you use like a custom bolt and bolt and regulator board that's way smaller. This first try, you got this? Oh my god, no. Right. <laughs> She'll tell you. It took a while. It was, it was, it was a lot of effort. <laughs> but I got really good at soldering because I was terrible before, and now I can solder pretty well. Any other questions about it? Do you use it? Yeah, sorry. of course. <laughs> What's your favorite game to play? On? God, that's a really good question. Probably Metroid Prime or Wind Waker. Or Smash Bros. Melee. Yeah, highly recommend it. What is it? Double Dash Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Double Dash is there. What? Gold Yeah, Golden Nightfire. Not N64. Nightfires. Nightfires were attacked. Yeah, no, I'm confused. Every time you use it. So, what did it do before? Um, it was a Wii before. Okay, so like Wii Golf. Yeah. 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 And, and what does it do now? Um, it's like a Game Boy now, except with a Wii in it. What's a Game Boy? Oh. oh. Um, <laughs> it's like a Wii. You can hold it. It looks like this. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> <laughs> so, is, there a, is there a screen where you try to like the white marshals and stuff? Yeah. This is it. This is it. Close. So I used real GameCube buttons and stuff, and then I stuck a screen in there, and then it plays video games. And you don't even need a TV. Or an awesome. Okay. Thank you. I didn't say it was not. I just, I just wanted to verbally verify that. It's not going to be cold. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That one's a good one. Good call. Good call. Any other questions? What do you say? What's up? Oh, uh, well, I kind of grew up working on a car a lot, so I thought maybe mechanically would be better. And the electrical kind of scared me, to be honest, especially going through uh, some of the circuits was confusing. I kind of forgot a lot of Kirchhoff law, so I was like, I'll just take the mechanics. But electrical is cool too, there's a lot of stuff. And, like, I learned more electrical than I realized that I ever would building that thing. So it was neat. A lot of, a lot of stuff going on. Anything else? Um, do you have like a step by step like instruction manual to go? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Samuel, you, you hacked something recently yourself? I can't say I have. <laughs> what was it? The calculator? <laughs> oh, um, I don't think anyone's going to do that. You turn the calculator into a game cube? Yeah, it's, you just use like program with Ted and so forth. Oh, okay. It's like a button. Okay. So you have to. Right. <laughs> uh, I I wrote a draft. I can I can try something. There's I compile some information. Maybe you can figure it out. There's this website called BitBuilt. That's pretty much all I need. They're they're great guys. Okay. I'll be honest. Yeah. yeah. I can I can send you some. Have Gail here send you some. I'm sure he would love the instructions as well. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I just. Yeah. I. I am. Played a video game since what's that one with the yellow thing that ate all the other stuff? <laughs> 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 um, for Dr. Fox and Dr. French, um, when Mitchell was considering a master's in sustainable engineering, he went and visited uh, Doug Armstead mm -hmm. at uh, Corland. Corland. Portland. Oh, he's at yeah. Portland. Okay. Portland. Yep. That's his program that uh, masters in nice. that sustainability. What was your impression? He was cool. It seemed like a cool program. It uh -huh. just, um, I don't know. I think I, I pursued engineering instead. So. Okay. But yeah, it was good. I brought Zach Shell with me. Oh, okay. How's Zach? He's okay. He's okay. He's okay. <laughs> he's okay. He works for the DOT now. So that's exciting. He works for who? Uh, the DOT. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, did he complete his degree? Yet? He's still working on it. Okay. Good. Yep. Um, he has our degree. Yep. 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 He has that. Okay. And he went up to. Um, he went to Clarkson. Clarkson. Yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, also from a can. Civil. Civil. Yes. Yeah. Much lamer. Yeah. All of the civil engineers, you know that they're lame. Why do you say that? I just like throw it. Okay. <laughs> I found when I went to grad school in engineering, um, in, in electrical, which I was in, it was nine to one male and female. And civil, it was like almost 50 50. So I think that's sort of nice. Oh, yeah, that was not 50 50. Yeah, that's impressive. I'm going to so yeah. say <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say, it'd yeah. be nice if, if this room did nine to one. <laughs> 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 well, zero, we're, we're, we only have one because you mentioned Roger Wick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, 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 and yes. Alumni. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Well, I want to thank our speaker. Yeah, and thank you for coming. And entertaining and enlightening us. Uh, and I also want to thank you guys. Um, more questions than anybody ever asked well, of a speaker. So, so really, so you were inspiring. So, <laughs> so the end came up at fifteen minutes, uh, yep. and I went, "Oh crap! What the hell are we going to do?" <laughs> and so, that was really good. Thank you. Actually, uh, and you guys let it. Raheem. Um, Michael, a little on the quiet side today. I need to quiet. Um, uh, Ryan, super interesting question uh, about um, and and Thomas. I was wondering, was you?